Okay. I'm not sure. I might like that. So you're going to be in this picture, am I right? Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's Biological Sciences Seminar. Our speaker today is Brian Allen. Um, but before I introduce him, I say administrative things. First, if you're Zooming, please mute. Second is that this talk is funded by the Roger and Jean Morrow Distinguished Lecture Fund. And Dr. Allen's giving another talk tonight, which is actually called the lecture or the Morrow Lecture. So it's seven o'clock in Stipes. That title is Global Change in Vector-Borne Disease. Uh, so I hope to see some or all of you there. Um, so this is Dr. Brian Allen. He got his bachelor's degree at University of Michigan. We just talked, so I went to school there too as a PhD student. He got his PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. He works at the University of Illinois, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign now. He is a professor of entomology in the School of Integrative Biology. Uh, he is also the associate director of academic affairs. Okay. Um, Dr. Allen is a broadly trained ecologist. His work focuses primarily on the ecology of infectious disease, especially ones transmitted by vectors like mosquitoes and ticks. Uh, he has worked globally. Uh, some of his work is North America, South Africa, South America, and also Africa. I think we'll hear about that today. He has written over 60 uh, scientific papers. Uh, his work has been featured in a lot of pop popular outlets like New York Times and Scientific American. So that's all. Dr. Allen's talk today is the consequences of livestock wildlife integration for tick-borne disease risk in central Kenya. So. Brian, okay. thank you, Dr. Meager. I really appreciate sure. it. Yeah, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I especially yeah. appreciate that I have full control over the pizza and cookies in front of the room here. I feel like uh, I can have some yeah. oh, good. Right. my <laughs> seminar. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, work that I've done over a number of years in Kenya, uh, which is a really uh, fascinating place to work as a biologist. It's also just a lovely country with wonderful people. Um, so I'm really lucky to have gotten to have spent part of my career working in such an amazing place. Um, the area of Kenya in which I work is really fascinating because I think when a lot of us think about the African continent and wildlife that occur there, we think of big national parks. So we think of places where wildlife are protected and it's like a, a, a pristine environment where humans live outside the park, wildlife live inside the park. And when you go there to view the wildlife, you enter into the national park during the daytime, you view the wildlife, and then you leave the park at night to go stay uh, outside the park. This is a part of the world, though, where there is no uh, federally protected land. So this is all privately owned land on which there's an incredible diversity of wildlife. And so I think it really is a very different model of wildlife conservation from what many of us may picture in our heads. Um, and so I will tell you a lot today about this specific region of the world. It's called Laikipia County in central Kenya. <laughs> like the fact uh, that it's uh, wildlands. Um, mute Ashley here. All right, sorry, oh, Ashley. Bro. Only only one person gets to speak. <laughs> so uh, despite the fact that there's this incredible diversity of wildlife, it's all privately owned, uh, privately managed lands. Um, some of the most endangered wildlife in East Africa occur in this region. Um, so if you can see these small, uh, they're not small, but in this photo, uh, these equids here, uh, those are grevy zebras. That's one of the most endangered species of equids on Earth. About 90% of their population occurs in Laikipia. So they're completely outside of officially protected areas. Uh, about half of the rhinoceros population in Kenya occurs in Laikipia, wild dogs, all kinds of other uh, spectacular predators. Uh, many of them depend on this landscape uh, to maintain viable populations. One of the main human uses of this region, though, is livestock production. And so it makes for a really fascinating landscape, uh, potentially uh, one in which there's conflict uh, between humans and animals. So uh, you may question my life choices. I'm a disease ecologist, um, and I mostly study ticks. And this is me out collecting ticks as part of my field work. Uh, when you sample ticks, you are often the sampling apparatus. Um, and so we wear these uh, full body suits, very important, tuck your pants into your socks. Uh, this is to protect ourselves from tick bites. Uh, the other uh, really advanced piece of technology that I'm using in this photo is a tick drag cloth. And so this is a one meter square white cloth. I drag through the vegetation 
ticks that are sitting there waiting for a host to come by will grab onto the cloth. And so I can sample ticks both on my person and on the drag cloth. Um, this is uh, one of my longtime field assistants, Jacob, uh, at the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, working with me uh, to, to collect and count ticks in the field. This is one of the most sort of striking scientific studies that I've seen come out in years, which was a, a paper that was published in PNAS in 2018 that attempted to address the biodiversity crisis through a different lens, which is not to count the number of species on Earth, but rather to add up how much they all weigh or their biomass. And the biomass projection for mammals on Earth, uh, especially terrestrial mammals, is striking. Uh, us, across the planet, about 60% of the biomass of mammals are domestic livestock of humans. Another 36% are humans ourselves. And only 4% of the mammals on Earth by weight are wild mammals. And so while there's still a lot of species diversity out there, species abundances have declined enormously. And a lot of that has been because of humans and our livestock consuming the resources that would have otherwise been consumed by wild mammals. And so this is a, another aspect of the biodiversity crisis that doesn't get as much attention as it should, is that there are very few, in terms of numerically speaking, wild animals remaining. In East Africa, we've been documenting these declines in wildlife abundance for decades, especially through the work of uh, conservation biologists like David Western, who since the 1970s have been performing aerial surveys of wildlife in Kenyan parks and in adjacent ecosystems. And so what you're looking at here is the uh, population estimates of ungulate species inside parks, which is the solid line here. And these are some of the big parks of Kenya, like the Sabo Parks and Amboseli and Nairobi National Parks, uh, Nairobi National Park. But then these dashed lines of the adjacent ecosystems as well, where some wildlife occur, but perhaps uh, are not as well protected as they are inside the national parks. What Western has come to realize is that the national park system is insufficient to maintain historical abundance of wildlife in this system. And it's in part because the declines of wildlife outside of the parks also affect the abundance of the wildlife inside the parks. The parks have political boundaries. The wildlife don't necessarily respect those political boundaries. Those are human uh, invented boundaries, not nature boundaries. And so as wildlife move in and out of these parks, they're hunted and otherwise persecuted and their abundances are declining because there's simply not enough protected land to maintain the historical numbers of wildlife. And so conserving wildlife outside of these parks is really critical if we want to protect uh, the numbers of, of wildlife. A great paper published uh, in 2016 by Agutu uh, looking at uh, changes in wildlife abundance over these periods of these aerial surveys performed uh, across East Africa, comparing the late 1970s to the mid-1990s and the late 1970s to the 2000s. What we see is that all wildlife species are declining in abundance. So any wildlife that you can survey from an airplane, their numbers are going down. And the only things that are increasing in abundance are domestic animals, especially sheep and goats are taking off as East Africa becomes more arid and that becomes a more uh, sustainable uh, domestic animal to produce compared to cattle. A lot of the story I'll tell today will be about cattle, but even cattle numbers are declining. And this seems to be kind of a climate change story that uh, cattle are not going to be as resilient in a more arid climate as our sheep and goats. But a lot of this wildlife biomass is being transformed into domestic animal biomass. This enters the uh, Lycipia district, uh, formerly known as the Lycipia district, now called Lycipia County. It's also a, a geological uh, formation, the Lycipia Plateau, that uh, you know, is the same, more or less the same as the political boundary uh, within central Kenya. Uh, it's where Mount Kenya uh, occurs, uh, if you're familiar uh, with that landmark. And historically, it was occupied by an indigenous people known as the Lakipia Maasai. Uh, European colonization in the early 20th century uh, really displaced uh, the native Maasai people, uh, including through the introduction of smallpox, uh, which killed uh, a lot of the indigenous people who lived in that region. Uh, Europeans colonized Lakipia because they saw it as a place to produce domestic livestock year round. Um, so part of the appeal uh, from a livestock production standpoint is that this is right on the equator. It's at about 6,000 feet, so it maintains kind of a cooler climate. And there's historically, there were three rainy and three dry seasons per year in Lycipia. And so it was only like a couple of months between typical rainy seasons. And so you pretty much had green grass year round. And so it was really appealing to European colonists as a place to produce livestock. With climate change, we're starting to miss some of those rainy seasons. And so we're seeing more and more severe droughts, uh, but that was what attracted people to the landscape uh, from abroad in the first place. 
Uh, different countries on the African continent have taken different approaches to wildlife conservation. Uh, Kenya uh, is at the extreme end with having completely banned all hunting in the 1970s. Um, and an interesting practice in terms of uh, wildlife management in Kenya is that the wildlife uh, belong to the Kenyan government. Um, so while the land can belong to individuals, the wildlife uh, are perceived as belonging to uh, the, the, the government. And what's really interesting about Lycipia is not only is the land privately owned and privately managed, but there's really different uh, approaches to land management and wildlife management across the different properties that occur in Lycipia. Uh, this is one of the, I mean, it's a really spectacular, uh, beautiful place. This is one of the uh, conservancies, um, uh, one of the properties that is for, uh, focused primarily on wildlife conservation. Um, so uh, this is a property where uh, really there's very little livestock production and the, and the main land use is wildlife protection. Uh, some of these properties that engage in wildlife conservation fund their wildlife conservation efforts through ecotourism. And so it's like going to a, a, a park or some other place where you would go on a safari. But these are much more high-end experiences. So for really wealthy tourists to have sort of uh, a high-end uh, safari experience, I would never be able to afford to go to one of these places as a tourist. I can only go there because I'm a scientist and can access these places as a scientist. Some of them are still maintained as livestock ranches. So for the same reasons um, that perhaps uh, the current managers or owners, great grandparents came to the region 100 years ago, uh, they still use it for livestock production. And then there are still some people who are indigenous to the region uh, who live on some properties. Uh, mostly these are communal lands that are uh, collectively managed. Um, and generally they are focused on livestock production, but some of them also uh, engage in wildlife conservation and ecotourism. So there is no sort of one approach to land management in the region. Uh, the conservation biologists Maggie Kennard and uh, Tim O'Brien uh, published a nice paper in like, about Lycipia in 2012 where they really tried to put the different land uses of Lycipia uh, into particular bins. Uh, the ones with the dark black lines around them uh, are also rhinoceros um, uh, sanctuaries. And as I mentioned, about half the rhinos uh, in Kenya are found on these properties in Kenya, uh, in, in, in Lycipia rather. And the folks um, who uh, have de dedicated their properties to rhinoceros conservation that's really the main economic activity that takes place on those properties. There's so much pressure to poach rhinos that they have to really invest heavily mm -hmm. in trying to protect those animals. And so this is kind of the depiction that uh, Kinnaird and O'Brien presented in 2012. But I would argue from an ecological standpoint, you can even simplify this further and essentially put most properties in Lycipia into one of three management categories. In my opinion, they're either primarily livestock ranches and the main activity that's happening on these properties is livestock production, especially Varong cattle, uh, which uh, are uh, were bred specifically for production in this region. Other properties are really focused on wildlife conservation, and the main activity happening on those properties is protection of wildlife. And then the thing that I find most fascinating about Lycipia is a decent number of properties are doing both. They're both conserving wildlife and they have abundant wildlife on the property, but they're also producing livestock and they have abundant livestock on the property. And so when I talk about wildlife livestock integration, this is the scenario I'm talking about where you have privately owned, privately managed properties where they have both wildlife and livestock. And it's a really controversial approach to management because the folks who tend to do this type of management would argue you're much better off doing one or the other. There's too many conflicts between these two populations of animals to try to have them on the same land. The people who are taking the more integrated approach say, no, there's actually a lot of benefits to having wildlife and livestock together. And so that's really going to be the focus of the remainder of my talk is these different management approaches and the uh, costs and benefits to each. So historically, it was perceived that cattle and wildlife should not co-occur because there were just too many negative interactions between the two populations. Um, so this is my favorite photo I've ever gotten of wildlife and cattle together. Uh, these are Haran cattle on the left and Koli cattle on the right, which uh, were bred in Uganda and just look really cool. They've got these huge, huge horns on them. Um, and then a couple plain zebras in the foreground. Um, so that's, for all my attempts to get a photo of wildlife and livestock together, that's the best one. Um, so the people who, who think, the managers who think these populations should not be combined, so that there are too many costs that when you have wildlife present, some of those wildlife are predators and they'll kill your domestic animals. When you have herbivores co-occurring, they're just competing too much for food. And so to a, a livestock manager who doesn't like wildlife, every blade of grass consumed by a zebra is a blade of grass that's not available for, for cattle. 
And then arguably, if, and I would argue, the greatest source of conflict is actually the exchange of infectious disease between the two populations, particularly because the wildlife tend to be more resistant to infectious diseases than are the domestic livestock. And ticks, this is where the story gets exciting, are likely the greatest source of exchange of infectious disease. Um, and because of that, for livestock management to be successful in this region, managers have to take some kind of approach to managing ticks and tick-borne pathogens for their livestock to survive. And so what you're looking at here is a device called a spray race. Uh, I like to think of it as a car wash for cows. Um, and so on livestock ranches where wildlife are present, uh, cattle have to be driven through these spray races about once per week. Um, in this spray race, there are nozzles all the way around that spray topical pesticide on the cattle that protects them against ticks. Um, here in uh, North America, if you've ever had the experience of putting front line on a dog, it's exactly the same idea. It's a topical pesticide that absorbs into the skin. Um, and in this case, these acaricides are really quite specific. They kill just ticks. Uh, and so here you can see a cow coming out of one of these spray races and it's just ripping um, with a caricide that's been sprayed all over it. And any tick that tries to feed on that cow within about a week will be killed uh, with, as a result of the contact with the acaricide. Um, so these acaricides are really quite effective at preventing tick bites. Uh, as a tick biologist, uh, I'm a kid in a candy store uh, getting to work over here. Um, there's this incredible diversity of ticks. In fact, Eastern and Southern Africa are the global hotspot for tick diversity uh, with uh, over 40 species of ticks present in some areas. And with that incredible diversity of ticks, you also get a correspondingly high diversity of pathogens transmitted by those ticks as well. Um, so this is a partial list of the pathogens that we've identified uh, present in this area, uh, mostly bacterial and protozoal pathogens. Uh, from an animal production standpoint, Filaria parva, the causative agent of East Coast fever, uh, it is by far the most economically costly. Uh, it kills cattle um, at almost 100%, uh, so it's a really uh, problematic pathogen if you're trying to produce cattle. Uh, some of these other pathogens only make wildlife sick, some of them only make livestock sick, some of them make humans sick, some do all three. And so uh, unlike sort of our simple tick-borne disease systems in North America, this is a really diverse uh, context in which to study ticks and, and tick-borne pathogens. A lot of what we know from the ecology of the Lycopia district is the result of a long-term large-scale experiment called the Kenya Long-Term Exclusion Experiment, or CLE. Uh, CLE was uh, built at uh, one of the sites in the middle of Lycopia, the Impala Research Center, which is a biological field station. Um, and in the late 1980s, uh, biologists who founded this field station had the foresight to create this really large scale ecological experiment and allow scientists to come to that part of the Kenya and conduct research there. I first started working there with my mentor. This is Dr. Felicia Keesing, uh, who introduced me to the field of disease ecology. And I was really lucky after I graduated college, she hired me to go run her project in Kenya for a year. And so I got to spend a year in Kenya after graduating uh, from undergrad, um, and it was a life-changing experience. Um, the CLE is a typical ecological experiment in the sense that it's a series of exposures. So when ecologists want to understand what impact organisms have on an environment, we often make fences and we exclude them. And you can see how the environment changes in the absence of that organism, and that gives you some idea of how that organism impacts that ecosystem. The CLE experiment consists of six different treatments that use different combinations of electrified fences to exclude ungulates in different combinations. And so there are three of these treatments that exclude different uh, wildlife, uh, a zero treatment, uh, which keeps out all wildlife, a W treatment, which has an electrified wire at about the height of a human, and so it keeps out the really big uh, herbivores like elephants and giraffes, but things like a zebra can go underneath it. And then the MW treatment is on facts that lets in the biggest, the mega herbivores and all other wildlife. Overlaid on top of this, and this was my favorite thing about what they, they did with this experiment, were those same three treatments with cattle. So if you see a C, that's a completely fenced um, enclosure, but with a gate that you can bring cattle through. And so you can actually simulate cattle herbivory in the presence or absence of cattle in the same kind of series. One of the reasons this works well is that because Baran cattle are always attended by a human herder, and so they've been bred to stay with a human. Um, this is in part because they're in a landscape with predators in it, and this human with this stick is tasked with keeping these cattle alive. And it's amazing that they're able to do that. These cattle sometimes get attacked by lions and other things. 
and these humans are, are able to defend their cattle. Um, and so because these are uh, cattle that can be moved through the landscape, we have these same three treatments, but also with cattle present. Um, so six different treatments replicated across three blocks. As part of the long-term research of my mentor, Felicia Keesing, we did surveys of ticks within the CLE experiment for seven years. These were walking surveys where we just walked through the grass, picked up ticks on our bodies because the grass is really tall. So it's not really suitable for dragging uh, with a drag cloth. And these were monthly surveys performed over seven years by me and some of her other assistants. And this uh, long-term surveys uh, revealed something interesting about the effect of cattle that none of us had anticipated. So what you're seeing here are the clay treatments uh, broken down by whether or not the, Brian. So the black bars uh, reflect uh, sites uh, treatments for cattle were allowed in. And the gray bars reflect the three treatments where cattle were not allowed, so where cattle were excluded. And then this is for two different species of ticks that are common in the area, Rhipicephalus pulchellus and Rhipicephalus prefix status. Once we analyzed the data that Felicia had assembled, we were really struck that the plots that allowed cattle had about a third the abundance of ticks that the plots compared to the plots that did not allow cattle. So the plots without cattle had much higher abundances of ticks compared to the plots um, that had cattle. And this was really striking to us because we assume with more animals, more biomass, you might expect there to be more, more ticks in the cattle plots, but just the opposite, the tick numbers were much lower. And it led us to realize that this acaricide treatment of cattle was perhaps performing an interesting function within the landscape, which is that the ticks can't perceive that the cattle are treated with pesticides. So when the cattle come through, the ticks climb on and they try to feed, they come into contact with this topical acaricide and they're killed by it. And so in a sense, cattle are an ecological trap. Ticks are not able to perceive that this is a low suitability host and they are killed in the process of trying to feed on that host. And so perhaps cattle are actually performing a valuable function in the form of tick control, that having the caricide treated cattle moving through the landscape, they're picking up ticks, they're killing them, and tick abundance is lower. And you would speculate that tick-borne disease risk would be lower as well. And so we were interested to then ask, okay, well, so we saw this phenomenon at the scale of the CLE, which is a really large experiment, but it's still much smaller than some of these properties at which these management decisions are being made. And so we wanted to ask, is this same thing happening at larger spatial scales? And so the next thing we did is we went to one of the conservancies in Lycipia that is really uh, bought into the integrated management model. So this is the whole Pejda Conservancy. It's one of the southernmost sites. It's right, uh, uh, you can see Mount Kenya in the background. Again, a really beautiful place uh, to get to do ecological field work. And Olpeja has a really high abundance of wildlife and a really high abundance of livestock. They're about equivalent, actually, in terms of the biomass. Um, so they're about half and half wildlife and livestock. The wildlife are allowed to move freely throughout the conservancy. The livestock are herded and managed in part to protect them against ticks. Here's, I just love taking pictures of cattle running through spray races. Um, so here's a cow going through a spray race. You can see this one in the background taking like a direct hit of the parasite uh, to the face. Um, <laughs> and that's good. They'll spread it all over their bodies. That's, that's the idea. Um, so the cattle are herded through the landscape. The wildlife are allowed to move freely. As a result, they had good records on the grazing history of the, of the uh, landscape. And so we were able to select different places across Old Pejda that had different grazing histories across which we performed tick surveys. So we went to sites where cattle hadn't been present for years sites where cattle hadn't been present for at least six months, areas that were currently experiencing cattle grazing at normal intensity, and areas that were experiencing cattle grazing at what the managers referred to as high uh, intensity, which is about double the number of animals that they would normally have. And that's when they're really trying to knock back the vegetation in the site. So the managers are using cattle as a vegetation management tool. They're actually moving cattle through the landscape. And if there's a place where the vegetation has become especially more of them, they'll bring in a, a large number of cattle and really kind of try to hit a reset on the vegetation. It's almost like fire management for the cattle. What we found is that sites that hadn't had cattle treated with a parasite present for some time had much higher tick abundances than sites that were currently experiencing cattle grazing. And so now at a larger scale than the CLE experiment, we saw something similar, which is that the presence of cattle really seems to reduce the abundance of ticks. So we started to think about this in the context of uh, NSF's language of a coupled natural human system. You have a landscape in which people are living, making management decisions. It's a very ecological uh, landscape where the interactions with the environment has a big impact on human health and human well-being. 
And so we, we applied for NSF's Couple Natural Human Systems grant, and we were very fortunate to receive one. And so then we took that opportunity to ask similar questions, but now at an even larger spatial scale, the scale of all of Lakipia. Here's the research team for the project. That's Dr. Sharon Okanga on the right. Uh, she was the postdoc uh, who led our team. Uh, some of our field technicians, including uh, Henry and Onesimus, uh, who worked on this project for years. Uh, we had a really great team of biologists uh, from Kenya uh, who did uh, a lot of the, the field work for this project. At Olpegeta, we really intensively study interactions between wildlife and livestock. This included putting GPS collars on livestock, so we could actually track their movements through the landscape and look at how wildlife responded to the presence of cattle. And at Olpegeta, we performed monthly tick surveys, vegetation surveys, and surveys of the abundance of wildlife and livestock through their dung. And then across all of Lycipia, we selected 25 properties, uh, which represents about half the properties in Lycipia. So this is an area about the size of Connecticut. Um, so we really covered uh, quite a bit of ground. And across these uh, two rounds of regional surveys, we collected the same biological data here, but now spanning a gradient in ownership and management decision making. So properties that went from being mostly livestock to being mostly wildlife and everything in between. And then we also collected some social data. So the couple natural human systems uh, program really is, is, was designed, unfortunately NSF is ending it, but it was designed to get natural scientists and social scientists to collaborate with each other. And so we had social scientists as part of our team, and they also collected data from these same properties pertaining to employment, security, the profitability of these different management scenarios, and human health and nutrition. So really trying to bring ecological and social data together to better understand uh, this, this system. So I'll first share just some demographic data that gives you a sense of these 25 properties across which uh, we collected data. So both wildlife and livestock, we assess their abundance through dung surveys, which is a really kind of great, simple tool. I love to combine the simple with the complex. Um, so it's a very simple way to assess animal abundance. Uh, we were also able to get data from the property managers about how many heads of cattle they had and things like that. So we had another way to verify our dung data uh, were accurate, at least for the domestic animals. So across these properties, wildlife density varies enormously from properties where wildlife were essentially absent to at least one property where wildlife were hyperabundant. Likewise, we saw a similar pattern for livestock. We had some properties where there were absolutely no livestock present, some sites uh, that had a very high density of livestock. And so we came up with this way of measuring a gradient of integration by just taking the ratio of wildlife to livestock and then log transforming that to simplify analysis. And so essentially these 25 properties very neatly fall across this gradient from properties, about a third of the properties in, that we surveyed in Lycipia are primarily domestic animals. About a third of the properties are primarily wildlife and about a third are integrated with equivalent numbers of wildlife and livestock. And so we did a pretty good job of capturing that gradient across Lycipia. And so for some of the analyses I'll show you next, I'll use this as kind of a continuous variable, but we can also just put it into bins and say that these are primarily livestock, these are primarily wildlife, and these are integrated. And so I'll show you some data in both contexts going forward. So this is my favorite graph from like years of research in Kenya. Um, so this is comparing the ratio of wildlife to livestock to the mean density of ticks that we surveyed in the environment. And we saw essentially exactly what you would predict based on our results at smaller spatial scales. The properties that were primarily livestock had very low tick densities. And so you have a lot more livestock than wildlife running around. So most of the hosts in that landscape were treated with a parasite and they're killing ticks. The, in, the integrated properties were somewhat intermediate and the sites with the highest tick abundances uh, were the sites that were primarily wildlife. So based on the results we had seen both at the scale of the CLE study and the scale of the old Pegida Conservancy, this was really consistent, and we saw more or less the same outcome at all three spatial scales. To analyze for pathogens, we had to develop a new system uh, because there were so many pathogens we were interested in screening for. And so luckily at, at the University of Illinois, there's a, a great resource, which is the Institute for Genomic Biology. And that institute actually partners with some private companies that are great at developing novel methods for screening for all kinds of things, including pathogens. And so we use the Fluidine Biomark HD high throughput amplification system combined with high seq alumina sequencing. Um, the way this works is if you're not familiar with the, the uh, phenomenon of microfluidics, think of like an electro chip. Uh, so, so a really kind of small flat plate on which you can move tiny amounts of fluid. So that's why it's called microfluidics because there's all these little channels that you can move fluids through. Essentially what you do is create primers for all the pathogens you're interested in 
and you run those primers across the surface of this chip parallel to each other. So this would be T parva, this would be uh, rickettsia, um, rickettsia rickettsii, something like that. And so you have all these different probes for these different pathogens of interest. And then you take your tick samples and you run those perpendicular to all those probes. Where there's a match between the DNA that's in a tick and the probe that's on the chip, it'll amplify that. It'll actually put a little tag on it. And so you know which tick it came from. And as a result, you can screen dozens of ticks for dozens of pathogens in a single reaction. I didn't have anything to do with inventing this system. I just took advantage of it, and it's really cool. Um, so you have to develop all these species-specific primers. That was the hard part. Uh, but then once we had those, we could test for a variety of pathogens and endosymbionts in our system. It's the most pathogens, uh, uh, the greatest diversity of pathogens I've ever detected in any study I've ever done. Um, and across uh, 1,287 ticks that we tested using this method, uh, about 15%, so about one in six ticks, uh, were positive uh, for some pathogen or another. Uh, what was really interesting to me, though, is that no one pathogen is particularly prevalent. And so I've seen, uh, working in North America, I've worked in places where 40% of the ticks are infected, but they're all infected with the same pathogen, like the Lyme pathogen. Uh, here, uh, we seldom saw infection rates above a couple percent. Um, so something like all filaria species combined, 4% of the ticks. Um, so with this really high diversity of pathogens, no one pathogen becomes particularly abundant, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, not, not a result I anticipated before we did this work. Before I interpret the next set of results, I want to give uh, a shout out to a colleague and, and some of his findings. So this is the work of Wilfred Odati. Uh, working out of the Kenya long-term exclusion experiment and research he published in, in science. So as you'll recall, one of the reasons that people wild, think wildlife and livestock can't co-occur is because of competition over food, particularly for the herbivores consuming the same resources. And uh, so that's been like kind of the historical perspective is that wildlife and livestock compete for food. And so that's one reason that they can go together. Uh, Wilfred used the CLE experiment and the different cattle treatments to specifically test this hypothesis. And because the Impala Research Center, where the Kenya long-term exclusion experiment is located, is a working cattle ranch, he was actually able to weigh the cattle before and after feeding in the CLE and fed cattle with and without wildlife and did this both during the dry season and the wet season, weighed them before and after. And so it was a really direct metric of our wildlife and livestock competing. If they're competing, you would expect the, the livestock to lose weight when they feed with cattle. And indeed, in the dry season, that's what he saw. Cattle gained more weight when they fed on their own than when they fed with wildlife. However, the exact opposite thing happened in the wet season, which I think is why Wilfred very appropriately got to publish this paper in Science, which is that the, wild, the cattle actually gained more weight in the wet season when they fed with wildlife than when they fed alone. So this was the first ever evidence of facilitation between wildlife and cattle, that the cattle were actually benefiting um, from co-feeding with wildlife. Uh, the mechanism that Wilfred invoked for this, and it's a little complicated, and I tend to butcher it when I say it, but I'm going to give it my best shot. In the dry season, the diversity of grasses goes down, and so the wildlife and cattle are feeding on the same grasses, so they're competing with each other for food. In the wet season, the diversity of grasses goes way up, and the wildlife and cattle actually have different feeding preferences, so they actually prefer to feed on different grass species. As a result, the cattle are feeding on the grass species that are competing with the grass species that the wildlife are eating, and the wildlife are feeding on the grass species that are competing with the grass species that the cattle are eating. And so they actually benefit each other by ameliorating the competition between the grasses that each of them prefer to feed on. And so that's the mechanism by which she actually finds cattle benefit from being integrated with wildlife during the wet season when the diversity of grasses is higher. And so we also tested for this same idea um, not in terms of cattle gaining weight, uh, but the uh, amount of vegetation that was available for wildlife livestock on each of the three types of properties we included in our analysis. Uh, just by chance, uh, we did two rounds of surveys. Uh, one happened to be during a very dry period of time. One happened to be during a very wet period of time. And so we almost uh, recreated this wet versus dry season comparison. 2014 was the drier year, 2015 was the wetter year. But what we found, especially in the winter year, is that the integrated properties where both wildlife and cattle were present had much greater abundance of green vegetation available for herbivores to consume than did either the cattle only or the wildlife only properties. And so effectively, we saw the same thing that Wilfred saw in the CLE experiment now at a much larger spatial scale 
that when wildlife and livestock co-occur, there's more food for both. And we actually didn't see any signature of competition. Even in the dry season, there was no significant difference uh, in that one year, uh, but there's no indication that there was less food available on the integrated properties. There's actually a slight trend towards more food available. Um, so we didn't see any evidence for competition over food, only evidence for facilitation. Perhaps the simplest way to ask the question, do livestock and wildlife compete with each other, is to compare their abundances. If there's a negative interaction, you might expect to see a negative relationship where there's a trade-off between the abundance of wildlife and the abundance of livestock. And so we compared the livestock dung uh, we sampled across the properties to the wildlife dung we sampled across the properties, and there was no significant relationship between the two. And so it suggests there isn't any direct trade-off in wildlife and livestock abundance, and in fact, some sites have quite high abundances of both groups. And so places like Old Pegida, which fall right in here, you can have a lot of wildlife and a lot of livestock on the same property, um, is what the uh, dung data tell us. Finally, we didn't directly study the problem of predation and negative interactions between wildlife and livestock via predation, uh, but property managers in the region have come up with a very simple solution to this problem. Uh, this is a metal corral that you move around the landscape. Uh, in Swahili, it's called a boma. Uh, historically, bomas were made by cutting down acacia trees and making a ring of them with the crowns, the thorny crowns facing outwards. And then at night, you would put all your cattle inside one of these acacia bomas, and that was how you protected your cattle from uh, predators at night. Bomas lions are very smart, and so lions figure out that they can roar at the cattle till the cattle panic bust out of the corral, and then they just pick them off in the dark uh, as they run around. Um, and so the trick was not to keep the predators out. The trick was to keep the cattle in. Um, and so they make these mobile metal corrals that they move around the landscape. You can actually see it just disassembles like a dog crate. Uh, you throw it in the back of the truck, and you can move it to different locations on the property. And you can really cut down on predation of cattle if you put them in inside this boma, this corral that they can't break out of. And then you have to pack them in there very tightly. If you pack them in there tightly enough, a leopard will not jump into the corral out of fear of being trampled. And so you have to make it tight. The cattle are happy to cooperate. They do not want to be eaten any more than the ranchers want them to be eaten. Uh, and so this really has addressed the problem of predation uh, in this landscape. So you can keep cattle uh, with uh, wild predators uh, as long as you manage them this way. So I'll end with talking about uh, a little bit of the social science data we collected because uh, okay, I think we've shown that there's some ecological benefit to having wildlife and livestock together. You get better control of ticks. Uh, you might actually have more food uh, for uh, domestic animals when they are combined with wildlife. But what about the economic consequences of these decisions? These are all privately owned, privately managed properties. And so what does it mean for the ranch managers? Well, we couldn't really get into the nuts and bolts of, nobody wanted to open up their books for us and let us collect that level of financial detail but they would at least answer some survey questions about whether or not their livestock operation was profitable, whether or not their ecotourism operation was profitable. And so using some simple contingency tests, we asked, are integrated properties uh, any less likely to be profitable than just livestock operations uh, for livestock production? And the answer is no, they don't uh, lose money any more than livestock only properties. Likely integrated properties, you could uh, be concerned, don't make as much money from ecotourism because maybe tourists don't want to see cattle when they're driving around on safari. And so maybe you would speculate that integrated properties make less money from uh, ecotourism. Again, our limited social data did not support that hypothesis. The, the integrated properties were just as profitable when it came to ecotourism as were wildlife only properties. So there doesn't appear to be any financial loss associated with having both wildlife and livestock present. What it led us to realize is that there's really two different gradients of integration we should be thinking about when it comes to the properties in this region of central Kenya. There's an ecological gradient, which is measured in their wildlife to livestock uh, ratio, but there's also where they're making money from. And those two things don't always align, which was really fascinating to discover. Um, so if you think about it simply as an ecological gradient, about a third of the properties are primarily wildlife, about a third are primarily livestock, about a third of those are integrated. If you think about it economically though, it's a slightly different distribution with most properties not making money only just from tourism. Only three of the 25 properties we sampled only made money from tourism. They were much more likely to make money from both or make money from livestock. And so if you think of this then as a grid in terms of decision-making, both from an ecological management and economic management standpoint, we can make some recommendations. Some of these properties have both livestock and wildlife present, but they're only making money from livestock. And so they're really kind of missing out on the opportunity to get some financial reward for having wildlife present. 
And so our recommendation would be that some of these pro properties that already have wildlife on them might think about trying to open a small ecotourism operation and make some money from those wildlife. And there's research showing that uh, managers really have a different perspective on wildlife when they're making money from having them present. Likewise, there's at least a few properties that only have wildlife on them. And at least it makes sense that they're only making money from tourism. If they were trying to make money from livestock, that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but if they could move into this integrated management category, they might get some of the ecological benefits of having livestock present. So they're already making money from tourism. They could make money from livestock and they could uh, get some of the financial benefit, uh, or sorry, some of the eco environmental benefit uh, that come from having cattle present. So at the end of uh, several years of working in this system, I think we've discovered there are some really interesting things that can be done with management on private lands that are maybe things you couldn't do as part of federally protected systems like national parks. At every scale, we saw that treating cattle with a caricide uh, reduces tick abundance. And so we do think that cattle can be used as an environmental management tool for trying to control ticks and tick-borne diseases. At least compared to the historical perspective on this problem, we found that integrating wildlife and livestock likely has more ecological benefits than people realize and fewer ecological costs. And there might be fewer trade-offs uh, and greater benefits from an economic perspective as well. So having both wildlife and livestock present increases your sources of revenue. It might make uh, a private property more economically stable over time, and that might have some benefits as well. I want to thank uh, the many collaborators who participated in this research. My mentors, Felicia Keesing and Richard Osfeld, uh, our postdoc on the project, Sharon Okenga, uh, other collaborators as well, uh, our funding uh, from a couple sources, including NSF, and then, of course, all the property owners and managers in this region uh, who allowed riffraff like us onto their properties uh, to sample ticks. Uh, here's a photo of our project team, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Panelists. Yeah, okay, yeah, or, or you're welcome to, Sean. Okay, go for it. Okay, okay, my first question is I think it was in your 2017 paper. Huh? You had the first column showed lower tick abundance, I think, uh, when cattle hadn't been there for a while. Yep. Can you explain that? Because I don't think it matched with your overall, like. Yeah, <laughs> uh, let me go back to the figure so we're all just on the same page, too, on the same slide, as it were. Uh, this one here, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's not a statistically significant difference between these two. Um, I, should have, okay. I should have done some asterisks. Um, these two are significantly lower than these two. Okay. I still think there's a trend here. Um, and I, you know, biologists love to interpret non-significant trends. Um, mm -hmm. And my interpretation is that in the areas where the cattle haven't been ab haven't been present for some time, the vegetation is really more abundant. It's, it's thick, it's dry, it's got little nutritional value. And so I think the wildlife are avoiding those areas that haven't been cattle grazed in a long time because there's less food for them there. I think what's happening is, and I couldn't tell you exactly the window of time, but I think it's months. Cattle move through an area, they knock back the vegetation, then you get this flush of green vegetation that follows, and the wildlife all come into that area to, to graze after the cattle have moved through. And so maybe in that three to six month zone is when you're getting the highest abundance of wildlife that they're basically with a time lag following cattle through the landscape. And so the places that the cattle haven't been in years, I think there's just less food for wildlife, so they're importing fewer ticks. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's my best explanation. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 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 Yeah, go ahead. The grading, is it like a rotational grazing? Like they have a certain padlock kind of thing. Well, yeah. not certain padlocks, but. Yeah, there's no fences, um, but they do have uh, boundaries that demarcate these grazing blocks. These ones are about one to 2,000 acres in area, um, and they have a, a map and a system for tracking where the cattle have grazed last. And because the cattle are always with a human herder, they're literally physically moving them to these places, grazing them there for a while, and then moving them to the next block. Do you know how often that is, like if it's a month or something like weeks? Weeks to months is okay. the typical time frame. It's, it's, it's driven by how much a manager wishes to reduce the vegetation in the area before moving cattle onto the next uh, block, the next grazing block, which then also intersects with rainfall and how much, you know, production of vegetation you're getting. Yep, yep, yep. Is different wild ungulates? prefer different grass species, so that would uh, affect uh, rates, stocking rates, so to speak? It would, yes, yep. Yeah. So um, 
And so that's, you know, I'm, I'm not a good plant ecologist, so that's kind of to the limits of my knowledge. But yes, exactly what you said. Um, there's different preferences, and especially in the wet season when the diversity of grasses are higher, the animals are being much more choosy about what they eat. And then in the dry season, everybody's just trying to survive. And so they're all eating the same limited grasses that are available. Yeah. yeah. Um, I noticed while presenting, you didn't mention the breed of the pattern, maybe it's the gamma, mutual, simple so why do you put into consideration the breed of the cattle? Why did I mention the breed of the cattle? Yeah, you didn't put that into consideration. I think having different breed could probably affect how they interact with wildlife. Yeah, yeah, I, I follow you. Yeah, so uh, the vast majority of the cattle in Lake Hippie are all Barang cattle, uh, which are descendant of the Zebu breed and were selected for central Kenya. Um, the reason why most managers in that region use Barang cattle is because they're seen as being very well adapted to that area. So well adapted to the climate. They're, they're supposed to be very tick hardy and resistant to tick-borne disease. And so compared to other cattle breeds, they, would, they perform better, even though they're, they're still quite susceptible to disease, but less than other cattle breeds would be. Uh, you see almost no dairy cattle in like Yeah, There's just too much tick-borne disease for them to survive there. And then the Ancoli that I showed uh, in a previous photo, um, there's only one ranch in all of like Kipia where I've seen Ancoli and it's that old Pegida Conservancy site. Um, and I think it's because they look cool. Um, so they don't have very many, they just have a couple hundred of them. Uh, whereas they have like 6,000 Barong uh, head. And so the Ancoli I think are, are actually for tourists is what they would want to make. It's because they're bringing tourists to a place where they're seeing cattle mixed with wildlife. They want something that looks especially exotic uh, to, to foreign tourists. Um, so the Ancoli, they don't eat them. They don't, they're just there for show, essentially. So basically everywhere we went are on cattle, the only breed that were present. And um, do you think cattle with other wildlife seeds, let's say, having a red color, not like this, but because cattle tends to attack anything red. Uh -huh. So do you think we will be able to integrate and mix what if? This is the guy is not black and white. This oh. guy is red. Do you think the color determines how to interact? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. You don't typically, one of the reasons this was a hard photo to get is because the wildlife and the cattle don't get that close to each other. They tend to keep like 100 meters between them. And I think the main reason is because there's always a human with the cattle. And so I don't think the wildlife are necessarily avoiding the cattle. I think they're avoiding the human that's with the cattle. Um, and so they are co-occurring in space and time, loosely speaking, in the sense that if you're looking at a plane, you can see a couple herds of cattle and you can see a variety of wildlife in that plane. But you would, I have never, for all the time I've spent there, I've never seen like zebras, in a, a herd of zebras and a herd of cattle mixed together. Um, they still keep a little space between them. Yeah, Rich? No, oh, um, sorry, this is a little bit outside of what you presented, but you know, since I was a kid, I see birds been really important to me. Yeah. All day. Yeah. That's something that can be investigated or... it, it is yeah yeah so we did a study on oxpeckers um so oxpeckers are famously tick-eating birds um and uh the, a previous generation of tick pesticides called organophosphates um, caused massive declines in oxpeckers um the current generation of the caricides are, are really tick specific so they're not supposed to harm vertebrates and so this was one of the things we wanted to test is, do you see variation in oxpecker abundance across these different management um, strategies? And so we actually went to some of these sites, surveyed oxpeckers, and we found equivalent abundance of oxpeckers across the whole landscape. So they don't seem to even be responding to the abundance of ticks. Um, and they certainly don't seem like they're being impacted by the pesticides. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I, if I can get a couple of questions I'll ask. So, Go for it. Um, so people usually worry about ticks because mm -hmm. of the pathogens they spread. Right. Um, so one thing you said, you, you showed us a slide that said, I found a lot of things, huh? but uh, I might have zoned out. Do you mm -hmm. have any data about how if tick abundance goes down or up, whether the pathogen amount in the environment, right? So if there are fewer ticks, yeah. are they all now infected? Or does yeah. the, is the fraction the same? So there's fewer uh, things out yeah, yeah, do you know? We do. You didn't zone out. I didn't okay. I didn't say it. So okay. you didn't you didn't miss anything. You were there the whole time. Okay. Um so essentially what we found was that on the livestock only properties, tick abundance was so low we couldn't even measure pathogen prevalence. We couldn't collect enough ticks on livestock only properties mm -hmm. to get an estimate of pathogen prevalence. On the integrated and the wildlife only properties, <clears throat> the prevalence of pathogens was equivalent. 
And so it's a less exciting part of the story, which is one of the reasons I, I skipped over it. Okay. Um, so, the, so there does seem to be that difference in tick abundance, but the infection rates are equivalent. When you take the collective infection rate, those all, all 40 plus pathogens combined, um, you see about the same rate of infection on livestock and, sorry, on integrated and wildlife only properties. Okay. So there's enough wildlife running around integrated properties that they're infecting a lot of ticks. Okay. You don't, you don't know this, but I'm a worm guy and all my people are not tick. So I'm always Yeah, yeah. Like, I've met a lot of your students know, today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of tick work. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the other question I was, I think, even more basic, I think, and that is, uh, I thought I heard you say that the, the wildlife are often not affected by these uh, pathogens. So... Why exactly do we care about how many ticks are out there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I hope what I said was that the wildlife are more resilient to the pathogens than are the livestock, because that's sort of what I've meant to, okay. to convey. Um, so it's not that the wildlife aren't experiencing tick-borne disease. And in fact, they almost certainly are. Okay. We have very little knowledge of what they're experiencing. Um, one of the only studies I've seen on this was performed in northern Tanzania and in Gorongoro Crater, uh, which is kind of a famous uh, wildlife uh, viewing destination. Um, and there were some outbreaks of disease that killed a bunch of wildlife, including black rhinos, which nobody wants to lose black rhinos. There's not enough of them left. Um, and when they tested those animals, they, det they detected multiple tick-borne pathogens in them. Um, so there probably are disease outbreaks, especially during stressful periods like droughts, where the wildlife succumb to tick-borne illness. They're probably just more hardy than are the domestic animals because of the longer evolutionary history with those pathogens. And I think you're addressing, like, it, it, are, are we only concerned about ticks because humans can get stuff from ticks, or we have some concern that wildlife can too? Yeah, I'm concerned about it from a wildlife conservation standpoint, that some of these sites, some of these wildlife have become so rare, and the remaining individuals are so precious, that even if we view this like, well, disease is a natural part of the system, and we should just let it all play out, I think I would argue the unnatural part is how how low the abundance is, has become of many of these wildlife species. And if we don't want to lose the few that remain, managing ticks is probably an important part of the equation. Oh, yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, yeah, it's looking good. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, another hand, that's it. Uh, and I'll say one more time. So another talk, I think, a broader variety yeah, of vectors much broader, yeah. tonight, right? Not just ticks, more. Yeah. Okay. All right, exactly. Thanks for coming. Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, one talk there. Yeah. John, did you meet Dr. Allen? Hey, John, I'm Brian. John's good friend. Okay, okay cool. I'm a native plant growing guy. Okay, cool. Probably a better place to college than I am. And also, Cadillac. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got a question. Okay, sure. Yeah. I remember you were talking about So, actually, can I say this? There's a class coming up. Yeah. Well, should we, so, should we rock it? Should we look at it? Let me get my flash yeah. drive. Yeah. That way, we'll let the yeah. transition happen. No, no, that's right. Yeah, get a lot of connections. I'm trying to set up. You did not make much progress here, Bob. Oh, well, that's. I'm working on that all day. Really? Okay. So. Yeah. 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 Goodbye, everybody.